Secretaria ha detto che questi valori erano sicuramente ancora troppo elevati e ha raccomandato dei livelli estremamente più bassi, passando quindi il limite per il particolato a 5 microgrammi a metro cubo e per l'NO2 a 10 microgrammi a metro cubo, dicendo chiaramente che al di sopra di questi valori possono esserci degli effetti molto importanti sulla salute delle persone. Quindi la Commissione europea ha proposto eh, una revisione delle linee guida attualmente eh, esistenti pubblicando a, se a settembre del 2022 eh, anche una valutazione dell'impatto e dei costi associati a diciamo a questi livelli di inquinamento e attualmente il Parlamento europeo sta valutando la proposta. L'Associazione Italiana di Epidemiologia aderisce all'appello lanciato dall'ISEE, cioè dalla International Society of Environmental Epidemiology e dall'ERS, l'European Respiratory Society, che si sono chiaramente espressi adesso, recentemente nel febbraio 23, pubblicando un commento e sulla necessità e della, di eh, tenere questi limiti così stringenti per il beneficio della salute pubblica e l'appello sarà pubblicato nel prossimo numero di epidemiologia italiano, tradotto in italiano, sarà pubblicato nel prossimo numero di epidemiologia e prevenzione che uscirà diciamo a fine giugno e quindi eh, l'obiettivo di questo webinar è un confronto tra i diversi stakeholders anche qui in Italia con l'obiettivo di dare informazione e soprattutto di costruire delle alleanze tra tutti gli attori eh, nel, che, che su questo tema lavorano nel nostro paese. I now switch in English to start our webinar and our first speaker will be Giorgio Gattani. Giorgio is the, in charge of the air quality monitoring department at the National Institute for Environmental Protection and Research, which is ISPRA, and is going to talk us about the Italian scenario of pollution. Uh, so please, Giorgio, floor is yours. You have... Uh, sorry, just the technical information. Uh, you all have a uh, maximum of 15 minutes. And uh, again in Italian, per tutte le persone che ci stanno ascoltando, è possibile fare delle domande ai relatori scrivendo nella sessione domande e risposte. Noi leggeremo le domande e i, i relatori risponderanno. Uh, sorry, Giorgio. No. Thank See you very much, Carla, for inviting me to this interesting meeting. I'm going to share my slide. Uh, okay. As you may know, as Carla said, Italy is under the spotlight since many are about air pollution. Okay. Okay. So we have uh, three infringement procedure pending or concluded for PM10, nitrogen dioxide, and PM2.5. Um, but the most the important thing that I would like to, to show you is the situation in uh, 2022. As for PM10 daily limit in force, we have still some 90% of monitoring stations that exceed the limit value. And since we are talking also about the proposed new directive and the world data guidelines, I show you I'm showing you uh, the situation also with respect to the, the proposed limit, with uh, uh, that shows a um, situation largely uh, in exceedance uh, in most region, other than those already already under under infraction for the actual the current limit values the most critical zone are indeed the the po valley the naples and caserta agglomerate and the sacco valley in the frostinone province uh, also if there are other other exceedances still of the actual the current limit values in uh, uh, isolated uh, station uh, in another side of the country. The same ap apply for PN2.5. We have almost reached the uh, current limit values of 25 microgram by cubic meter. 
but uh, if we ever look to the proposal of the limited values, we have a large exceedance of 78% 70, 70, uh, and almost all the world that gather, um, the world that gallery line are exceeded. This is uh, the same figures that happens also in Europe regarding the world that gather lines 40 and 2.5. And for nitrogen dioxide, we have again uh, an almost uh, uh, reach the uh, respect of the current limit value while uh, we have a widespread uh, exceedances of both proposed limit value and what that gallery line. In these cases, uh, we have the, the, the remaining station that exceed the current limit values are mainly uh, urban street high volume traffic volume station located in the main uh, urban uh, city of Italy, Turin, Milan, Rome, etc. Uh, we are facing also uh, the, the problem of exceedances of ozone. Here I show you the figure for 2021. Also because I would like to underline that other than for health uh, issues, ozone is important for ecosystem damage. Uh, and we have both a long term objective for health and for uh, ecosystem largely exceeded in, in all the country. And naturally, uh, the most stringent proposed uh, long term objective that are uh, the same for the proposed directive and the, the world that guideline are obviously largely exceeded exceeded in all the country. Uh, it should be noted also that we have some exceedances also of the benzo AP rain annual target. Uh, in the proposed new directive, this will become uh, probably uh, uh, a limit value uh, if uh, this uh, will be um, confirmed after the negotiation that are ongoing. Uh, these exceedances uh, is uh, mostly related to a uh, zone where woody biomass for civil eating is, uh, uh, is used and together with uh, a winter weather condition that favor accumulation of pollutants that typically happens in the northern side of the country, but also in some central and uh, internal side of the country. So the, speaking about the air pollution, we have to deal with atmospheric chemist complexity. So the particles that are directly emitted are not the only particles that we breath. Uh, particles form into the atmosphere, starting from other pollutants such as nitrogen oxide, volatile organic compound, ammonia, sulfur oxide, that in the condition that uh, happens, particularly in the, the zone where we have seen, uh, we have the larger uh, pollution, uh, these mm, mechanisms are favor favorable. So uh, particles of organic carbon, ammonium sulfate, ammonium nitrate constitute a large portion of PM and are formed directly into the atmosphere coming from this pollutant. Moreover, nitrogen oxide and volatility organic compound are involved in the ozone formation. So this is another important thing to say. And also coarse particle coming from both natural and anthropogenic source form the bulk of PM10, PM2.5 concentration. Uh, together with fine particles, are fine and with a fine particle carry also uh, highly mm, relevant toxic for toxicological issues compounds such as metal and uh, particularly aromatic hydrocarbon. So dealing with orographic and climatic condition is an important issue when we talk about atmos atmospheric pollution and all, uh, uh, particularly in Italy and so for uh, uh, and try to explain these topics. 
I'm showing the uh, data from two monolithic stations, the first uh, in Rome, urban background station, the second in the Sacco Valley, also urban background station. As you can see, uh, the winter condition favoring pollutant accumulation and secondary particle formation are particularly strong in the Sacco Valley, leading to values much higher during winter in uh, this, um, this city than in Rome, where obviously the uh, emission burden is really different. Uh, so this is just to, to point out the, the problem we are facing with this kind of condition that are also typical of the Po Valley and uh, other internal part of our country. So let's talk about how did we get to this point. Indeed, we uh, in, in the respect of the di directive regarding the natural emission ceiling, we are on the road to get the target for 2030 in terms of reduction of emission. Uh, we have some delay mostly in PM 2.5 directly emitted particle, uh, while for other pollutants we are on the road. And the scenarios uh, shows that probably we will get this target uh, for 2030. Uh, this is confirmed where, where when we look to the uh, trend analysis, this is for instance, the APN 2.5 figures for the last 10 years, where we can say that we have got uh, a statistically significant decreasing trend for the most large part of monitoring station. And the same happens for nitrogen dioxide, for instance. So uh, looking at what we can, we should do to reduce uh, uh, air pollution, we can um, focus into the main sources of pollution, which is namely uh, road transport and nitrogen oxide emission that share some, in, in this case, I, I show you, I'm showing you the figure from the Po Valley. We have some 62% uh, of road transport emission for nitrogen oxide coming from road from road transport and other mobile sources, and uh, within this this portion, uh, a large portion is due to diesel vehicle fuel vehicles. But another important thing to say is that non-industrial combustion contribute largely to PM10 directly emitted particles, which is with a share of 56%. And among this 56%, some 97% came from, uh, sorry, so, came from uh, residential plant using biomass to as fuels. And the third challenge we are facing is that uh, regarding the emission of ammonia, ammonia, as we have seen, is an important precursor of particles. And in a region as the Povarele, uh, the emission uh, intensity in terms of density by square kilometer is particularly high um, compared with Italy, for instance, and EU, EU 28. Another important thing that we I would like to say is that there are some pollutant such as black carbon and methane okay, that are mm, important uh, short-lived climate pollutants, but they are also uh, important in terms of both uh, health impact such as black carbon and tropospheric ozone and also cultural heritage uh, impact. Uh, we should be noted that they, are, they have a much higher warming potential than carbon dioxide. So this is our, this is our important life, um, climate pollutant. And also that uh, black carbon contribute to melting glaciers. And when glaciers mel melting, are melting, uh, methane is emitted. So add to what is emitted from uh, agriculture. And this lead to the formation again of the atmospheric ozone. 
that uh, as we have seen uh, goes to damage health but also ecosystem and crops productivities so as to conclude oh sorry <laughs> okay uh, as to conclude the the full implementation of measures to reduce air pollution in, in italy coming from the national air pollution control program as well as from agreement among the Italian Ministry of Environment and the region, where the accidents has been recorded are urgently needed. And we hope that a strong synergy with local urban mobility plans and with action and undertaken for addressing mitigation and adaptation to climate change will be found in order to, uh, to reduce air pollution. And also, uh, uh, as we noted, the reduction of short-lived climate change substances such as methane, black carbon, and ozone will certainly have core benefits in reducing both air pollution and global warming issues. At the end, individual awareness is also really important eh, to reduce air pollution. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank you, you Giorgio. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk, especially for the for pointing out so well all the sources of the various pollutants. It was very, very also didactic in a certain way, very useful, I think, for all of us. And it's now a pleasure for me to give the floor to Massimo Stoja, who is a senior statistician at, at the Department of Epidemiology of the Lazio Regional uh, Health Service. So Massimo, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for, for the invitation. I will now share the screen. Okay, I hope you can see it well. It should be coming. Yes. Okay, so good morning. In this talk, uh, I will uh, start from the, uh, from the scenario, from the framework that uh, Giorgio just presented on the environmental situation, and, and I will move into the health topic, which is the central for today's uh, uh, seminar. And I will speak about the impact on health from PM 2.5 and NO2 in Italy, with some focus on the Pabali region and in the major cities of, of, of the country. I will briefly touch upon the following points, air pollution and health, a very, very brief introduction uh, following what Carla was introducing a few minutes ago. I will then present some of the latest evidence in terms of the health effects from long-term exposures to, to air pollution. I will uh, briefly present some of the methods which are implied when we investigate the health impact of air pollution. And finally, I will go into some of the results of the health impact of air pollution in our country. And I will conclude with some uh, summary points. So I will be quite uh, uh, fast in this first part because I think we all of us are pretty well aware of how much relevant is the topic of air pollution uh, compared with many other risk factors. In, in, uh, in a recent publication from the Global Burden of Disease in the Lancet, the, the investigators compared the 87 risk factors uh, for, uh, for human health and air pollution turned out to be the fourth cause of premature mortality, causing approximately 6.7 million uh, premature deaths in 2019. And this is the same uh, uh, picture from a different source. This is WHO, World Health Organization, which basically distinguished between uh, outdoor uh, air pollution and uh, household exposures. And also they basically uh, 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 estimated approximately 8 million deaths per year. Uh, due to accidents of air pollution. Um, and also they pointed out that more than 90% of the world's population lives in places where air quality exceeds the WHO guideline limits. And when we come to Europe, this is the latest uh, uh, web report from the environmental, uh, the European Environmental Agency, where again, we can see that in 2020 in the European Union, 96% of the population, of the urban population was exposed to levels 
of PM 2.5 above uh, the, the guideline limits from the World Health Organization, and which amounted to approximately 238 premature deaths in the EU 27. So when we speak about the health effects from long-term exposures, I will briefly here summarize some of the latest evidence. And in particular, I would like to, uh, to present here a, a very brief summary of the ELAPS study. The ELAPS study has been extremely useful because uh, it was a study, uh, ELAPS stands for European uh, uh, Health Effects from Long-Term Exposure uh, uh, in Cohorts in Europe. And basically the idea of this study, which was funded by the Health Effect Institute in the US, was to investigate the shape of the exposure response function between uh, chronic exposure to air pollution and co-specific mortality with a focus on the uh, low levels of air pollution. And that was exactly meant to provide new evidence in order to inform the new, the new uh, air quality guidelines. In, the, in this study, uh, where there was a pooling of many different cohorts, so there were eight cohorts, let's call it traditional cohorts, so with an extensive amount of information on the individual level uh, uh, co covariates, which allowed uh, uh, quite a, a careful and a strict control for potential confounding. That amounted for almost 325,000 individuals which were followed up. And uh, the, basically the study reported uh, quite strong relationships between the long-term exposure to PN 2.5 and natural cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, respiratory mortality. And this is in the yellow line. You can see hazard ratios uh, uh, quite, uh, quite strong, uh, showing so a very adverse effects of air pollution. In the bottom part of the slide, basically applying a similar protocol, so we pull together results from seven very large administrative cohorts in Europe for a total of 28 million individuals. In this case, we had a little bit less information at the individual level, but we complemented the, the, that lack of information with a, an extensive amount of contextual covariates, which allowed uh, to control for confounding. And again, uh, we gained a very strong power and we were able to detect pretty strong uh, relationships between the co-specific mortality and PN2.5. Uh, so these results were recently taken from Barbara Hoffman, which is uh, invited today, together with other colleagues, and very recently the European, the International Society for Environmental Epidemiology, together with the European Respiratory Society, produced this uh, uh, very important paper, where basically they, they said that we need to, to use the latest evidence in order to estimate the health impact from air pollution. If, if we pull together, if we combine the results from the seven large administrative cohorts, uh, six of them are nationwide, the seventh is the Rome Longitudinal Study. If we combine them together with the eight pooled cohorts from ELAPS, we come up with uh, estimates of effect which are quite stronger than those previously reported in, uh, in systematic uh, uh, reviews. And so this is what we did in, the, in this, in this uh, study. Basically, we, uh, I, I will now uh, present some of the recent uh, results, the most recent results that we produced in terms of the health impact of our pollution, starting with a brief methodological note. So without going too much into the, the, the technicalities, into the algebra, basically there are a few ingredients which, which are necessary to quantify the total number of deaths attributable to annual concentrations of a specific pollutant exceeding a threshold. First of all, we need to have estimates of population weighted exposure to some pollutants. And in this effort, we consider PN2.5 and NO2 at the municipality level. We need to define some thresholds, some counterfactuals, saying that uh, up to that threshold, we assume there is no effect, but above those threshold, what happens? And for this exercise, basically, we consider the first, the, 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 the previous air quality guidelines from 2005, uh, which is an uh, annual average of 10 microgram per cubic meter for PN2.5 and 40 microgram per cubic meter for NO2. 
And then we, we checked what happened if we instead use the recent, the most recent, the latest air quality guidelines from 2021, which is five for PM2.5 and 10 for, uh, uh, for NO2. Then of course, we need to have some uh, mortality rates at the municipality level. And finally, we need to have uh, an estimate of the exposure response function. So the beta is the basically the log relative risk that we have seen from the previous slide. Uh, okay, so we start from the exposures. In these two maps, you can see the population weighted exposure to annual mean concentrations of PM2.5 on the left and from NO2 on the right. All these colors represent uh, uh, annual concentrations as micrograms per cubic meters. Very brief note on how we derived these maps. Basically, we developed uh, uh, together with the uh, ISPRA, we developed a spatiotemporal model using uh, data from the monitoring stations and uh, uh, data from satellite uh, retrievals, from atmospheric chemistry models, from uh, land use parameters, from road, net road network, de population density, and so on and so forth. We built a, a, a random forest model, so a machine learning model. And for each square kilometer of Italy, we estimated the daily concentrations of the two pollutants, and then we quantified the annual averages. But in addition to that, since we are speaking about population weighted exposure, since for each grid cell, for each one kilometer cell, we also have an estimate of the resident population, when we went uh, to average these concentrations at the, at the municipality level, basically we applied uh, a weighting factor. We weighted uh, the cell more if there was more population inside. So for example, if, you are, if we are in a municipality with a, a lot of people living in the center and large suburban or rural areas, we weight the inner cells much more than we weight the outer cells. In this way, we account much better for the where the population actually resides. In terms of the exposure response functions, I mentioned uh, for natural cause mortality that we have used the estimates from the recent paper from Barbara and colleagues. Instead, uh, for a, a cause specific mortality, we relied on the uh, on uh, two uh, uh, systematic reviews, which were commissioned by the WHO in 2020, exactly to inform uh, the incoming uh, air quality guidelines. One was for PN 2.5, Chen and Hope 2020, which investigated both cardiovascular and respiratory mortality. And the other one was for NO2, uh, uh, realized by uh, Wang Fu and Atkinson, which only focused on uh, respiratory uh, mortality. And so we finally come to the results. Uh, we start with PN 2.5. This is quite a dense slide, so I will guide you through, through this, we present here the annual deaths and fraction, so the percentage, attributable to long-term exposure to PN 2.5, exceeding the WHO air quality guidelines, which is the threshold 10 microgram in the middle uh, from 2005, and the threshold 5 microgram uh, on the right side for the threshold 2000, uh, for the guideline 2021. We did that for the natural cause mortality on top, cardiovascular mortality in the middle, respiratory mortality in the bottom. And we did that for Italy and then for the macro regions. And then in the next slide, we will see what happens in the Po Valley and in the major uh, urban uh, uh, metropolitan areas of the country. So first of all, we see that the population weighted exposure is pretty high. So if you think about 10 or five, you can see that on average, we have 16 in Italy, which becomes 20 in the north, 14 in the center and 12 in the south. So most of the Italian population is exposed to levels beyond uh, what is said from WHO being uh, no risk limits of five, but even beyond 10. And when we move to the estimates of uh, uh, attributable fractions, we can see that on average, we estimate more or less 6.7% of total deaths attributable to exceedances of 10 microgram per cubic meter, PN 2.5, which correspond to 6.7%, 41,000 deaths, which becomes 72,000 and 11.7% if we use the five microgram per cubic meter. And you also see that it's quite a strong heterogeneity geographically with much higher percentages in the north 
and the lower in the central and southern Italy. Uh, and of course, the similar picture for co-specific mortality. In this case, the attributive for fractions are, uh, are compared, uh, are uh, uh, calculated using the total mortality as a, as a denominator, so to, to be compared with what happens with natural cause uh, mortality. But still, we can see pretty large numbers of uh, attributable cases, both for cardiovascular and for respiratory immortality. If we focus on specific areas of the countries, this is only for natural cause of mortality. Again, we can see that in the Po Valley, 11.5% of all deaths were attributable to exceedances of 10, and 16% were uh, uh, attributable to exceedances of 5. And uh, that is also, it is also interesting to see what happens uh, in the major metropolitan areas. Basically, we see that especially in the big cities from the north, we have uh, attributable fractions which are extremely high, 20% of, uh, of all deaths, or 26, uh, 27, uh, if we consider the more stringent uh, threshold. I will briefly present the results for NO2. So same results in this case, we don't have cardiovascular mortality because we have used the, the, the exposure response functions only for natural cause and respiratory mortality. Not, not, not much happens if you use the threshold of 40, because if you can see the population weighted exposure is around 30.7 microgram per cubic meter for the, the entire country, which becomes 36 in the north, 29 and 24 in the central and southern Italy. So there is not much going on if we use the higher threshold of 40. But since in the last years, a lot of evidence accumulated on the harmful effects, even far below the 40 micrograms, the new guideline uses 10 as, a, as, the, as the threshold. And if we consider that, we can see that the, the, the situation is much, is much worse with around 5% of the total deaths attributable to exceedances of 10 microgram per cubic meter for annual NO2, with no big differences across geographical areas. Uh, again, if we go into the Povali, but most importantly for NO2 in the largest uh, cities of the country, we can see that uh, there is not a big increase in uh, attributable deaths in the Povali. But uh, the, 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 the situation is much worse inside the cities. We know that NO2 is one of the main, is mostly driven by combustion sources, by uh, road, uh, road traffic. That is a big topic in uh, big cities. And that is why we can see pretty high concentrations of NO2 in uh, these cities and correspondingly very high percentages of uh, uh, attributable deaths from exceedances of the threshold of 10. So to conclude, we, first of all, uh, only considering the exposure, this is very much consistent with what Giorgio presented only about the monitors. This is about the model, but we can see that uh, the national average population weighted exposure is much higher than uh, the 2021 uh, air quality guideline values for both pollutants. The exceedances of WHO to this 2021 for PN 2.5 cause approximately 72,000 extra deaths each year and 40,000 for NO2. It is very important to stress here that we cannot add the two figures because there is a correlation between the two and so there is an overlap in terms of uh, uh, the extra deaths attributable to, of the, for the two pollutants, but it is still important to keep these figures in mind. Most of the impact is found in Northern Italy for PN 2.5, in the Po Valley region, again, for PN 2.5, and in the larger cities, especially for, for NN2. And so I would say that to conclude, uh, and so to give the possibility also to Barbara to move on from here, the new air quality directive, which is under uh, scrutiny and under discussion now at the European Parliament really should align as much as possible to the WHO 2021 air quality guidelines. And I conclude with thanking all the working group. This, is, this has been a, a, a work effort which involved many institutions, most importantly, the, the Italian National Institute of Health, 
the, which provided the uh, health data, of course. Uh, the, the ISPRA, as mentioned before, the National Network of Environmental Protection Agencies as well, uh, which provided environmental data, the Department of Epidemiology in the Lazio region, which built the, the, the spatial polar models, and all together, of course, we defined the methodology and we produced the, the, the estimates. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Massimo. Uh, I think that your data are really, we are really impressed because saying that having three times the population with the exposure for both uh, PM 2.5 and NO2 results in a really huge number of attributable deaths, preventable deaths, because saying that 72,000 deaths each year are attributable of this value of concentration of PM 2.5 and almost 30,000 attributable to NO2 is really a huge impact on health. And that's why the Italian Epidemiologic Association is together with all the other scientific association in asking for a new uh, directive that they can safe do something to, and I don't know, um, had give very the message that we have to do uh, everything possible to reduce the emissions and the concentration in order to save the health of citizens. So now, with my pleasure, I want to introduce you, Barbara Hoffman. Barbara is the head of the Environmental Epidemiology Department and professor of Environmental Epidemiology at the Heinrich Hein University in Düsseldorf, and also for the period 2023 and 2026, Barbara is the Earth's Advocacy Council Chair. So please, Barbara, uh, talk us about the critical aspects of the proposal, uh, the, of the proposed EU directive and the different position of the EU countries, including Italy. Please, Barbara. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Carla. Thank you for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk here. And I'm starting to share my screen. Uh, let's see. Um, I hope you can see now um, my screen. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. So I cannot see you anymore now, but that's fine. Um, yeah. Okay. So after Massimo just told us about these, I mean, described to us these really disturbing um, results um, and showing us how, how, um, uh, devastating air pollution is acting on um, the Italian, but also, of course, on the European population. The question is, what are our politicians doing to prevent that and to um, protect us from these um, effects? Because we are, of course, all of us are um, under the influence of this um, terrible risk factor. So um, Carla asked me to talk about the current process of um, yeah, lawmaking in the EU, specifically now here for the so-called ambient air quality directive, and um, yeah, where we stand right now. Um, just to go back a few steps, how does air pollution regulation in Europe work? It, is, it consists of three pillars. The first part is um, reducing emissions. And we have two different sets of laws that um, aim to reduce the emissions. One is the so-called National Emission Reduction Commitments Directive that um, gives for every, every sector of, um, of um, uh, economy a certain um, reduction by which, which has to be achieved um, in terms of emissions. That means the traffic sector emissions have to go down in five years by so and so many percent and the emissions from agriculture and industry and energy production and so on. Um, so this is um, gives these um, uh, aims or that need to be achieved in terms of reduction for every sector. In addition, we have source specific standards and the most um, the, the best known one is, for example, the euro standards for the cars. Uh, that uh, specifically say how much a new car is allowed to emit. 
Uh, but this is not the only source specific standard. We also have, for example, the eco design directive that um, addresses um, uh, wood burning stoves in the house or the in industrial emission directive and, and some more. Now, on the other hand, um, the European Union is also regulating the quality of the air that we inhale. And this is what we are actually talking about now. This is the ambient air quality directive and that uh, regulates maximum concentrations for all of these um, substances. And this is the current version we have. And um, Massimo already talked about this. The important, most important numbers here are the annual concentration for PM 2.5, which currently is not allowed to be more than 25 micrograms. And then we have the annual standard limit value for NO2, which is uh, currently 40 micrograms per cubic meter. These were set in 2008. And since then, um, air pollution epidemiology and knowledge about what air pollution does has evolved exponentially. And um, even in 2008, these numbers were outdated. Uh, by now, they are hopelessly outdated. So what's happening to improve the situation in Europe? Um, First of all, just to give you a um, little introduction into how laws are being made in Europe um, and to know the players that are uh, yeah, active here. So if you want to make a new law, like the ambient air quality directive in Europe, there are three main players here. One is the commission, the European commission, and that one drafts a legislative proposal. And the one for the ambient air quality directive was published in October um, 22nd. So then the next step is that the EU parliament, um, which is directly elected, as you all know, uh, forms a position on this, on this proposal and um, amends the proposal. So it can make it more strict or more, uh, more loose. And um, of course, the um, Parliament has to agree on a certain set of amendments in this proposal. And this process is currently happening. So um, the different um, parties are coming together. Um, it, this takes place in the so-called ENVI committee in the EU Parliament. That's a standing committee of, I think, 88 members from all parties in the EU. And they... Um, yeah, make changes to this proposal and have to agree on it. And of course, there's very different opinions on uh, how these changes should be done. And um, they have to come up with, with um, some kind of compromise and vote on it. The committee will vote on it at the end of this month. And then early next month in July, uh, the, par the full parliament, the plenary, will vote on this. So um, this is... Uh, currently very much debated in Brussels. Now then the th third um, group here, third institution is the um, Council of the EU. This, this represents the um, national governments of all 27 member states. And the council also needs to come up with, a, um, with amendments and with a position on this proposal. So what's very difficult here is, is the council consists of 27 governments. So you have 27 different opinions and um, positions. So the first thing is every member state needs to find a position. Then in the council, they need to come up with a position. And then finally, um, council and parliament will negotiate in the so-called trilogue under um, kind of um, moderation of the European Commission. And then finally, at some point in time, they both, both chambers here need to vote on the proposal. And um, yeah, just to show you how difficult it is and how many players we have here in the council, I have the example for Germany. Um, the leading ministry is uh, for this specific piece of legislation is the Ministry of the Environment. Um, and I guess that's the same in Italy. It gets technical advice and input from our German Environmental Protection Agency, which is the UBA here. Uh, it, of course, gets input from other ministries and the ones that are very important here in this case are, of course, health. 
but also traffic and economy. Um, then as Germany is a federal state, um, all the different um, state governments and their environmental agencies also all, all have a say as well. So they all give input. And then finally, there are other stakeholders like insurance companies um, that will also have an opinion on this. And all of this goes into the, the ministry here and they have to come up with some position which they then carry to the um, EU Council. Um, now the process time-wise is a very long one. And here you see the timeline from beginning of 2020 until um, second half of 23, where we are almost at right now. The whole thing started in 2019 with a fitness check conducted by the European Commission. This fitness check pretty much just um, checked whether the current um, ambient air quality directive, which is the one from 2008, was uh, fulfilling its um, aims. And they came up with the conclusion, no, it only partially, uh, is only partially successful um, because it, it is not able to protect the European population adequately. Therefore, the council decided uh, in um, early 2020, that we need a new directive. Um, then in the second half of 2020, the European Environmental Agency um, uh, published one of its yearly reports, which kind of laid the groundwork for the next, um, uh, for the next steps, because here, um, as Massimo already showed you, they always published the number of deaths um, per year in Europe and also for every country. Um, the next step was, an, was a, an expert consultation where um, representatives from um, civil society, from scientific organizations, uh, from all kinds of stakeholders uh, were able to say what they expect from a new ambient air quality directive. And as um, representatives of the International Society of Environmental Epidemiology and of the European Respiratory Society, um, we also gave input here in this export consultation. Uh, a next very important step in this whole process was then the um, publication of the WHO air quality guidelines. This one was so important because both EU Parliament and European Commission had pledged before that they would uh, align the new ambient air quality directive more closely with the WHO um, air quality guidelines. Uh, so this is why they were all waiting for this publication here. Um, after this, another targeted consultation took place. So once again, the scientific societies were able to give detailed input also in terms of where uh, limit values should be um, for the development of the legislation, which was then finally um, adopted and published as the legislative proposal in the second half of um, 22 last year. And currently, as I said, uh, currently the EU Parliament is in the process of forming its position and will be is almost finished. And um, the Council of the EU, which is the member states, they have just started or are in the process also of forming their position. Now to make this specifically ambitious, um, this whole process, I mean, um, the, these two legislative bodies, they still have to you know, find a compromise then. All of this needs to be done and finished by spring of 2024, because then we have the new elections and we will get a new commission. And anything that is not decided and voted on by spring 2024 will be tabled and until um, we don't know when. So it's really important to speed the process up so it, it's finished by the end of the year, pretty much. Um, okay, so the legislative proposal is based on an impact assessment. Um, similar to what Massimo already showed you for Italy, but they also did the same thing for all of Europe. And um, I'll explain a little bit the process, how this works. 
Um, in this impact, or before the impact assessment started, the European Commission defined seven different scenarios. The baseline scenario was nothing is going to change in terms of legislation. We will just uh, keep all the legislation we have and see with that new, with that already um, um, voted on legislation for you know industrial emissions and Euro Seven and all that um, and, and national emission ceiling reductions. Where do we? Um, how, how does the exposure develop? So that's the scenario one, no changes to current standards. Then they defined different um, aims, different goals, uh, according to the interim targets of the WHO and the guideline value of the WHO, and um, said they would either want to achieve this by 2030 or 2050. And after they have de they have designed all these um, decided on all these scenarios, the next step was um, to uh, see what needs to be done to to achieve these various scenarios. And I give you some um, information here on the three scenarios with that uh, wanted to achieve um, certain. Uh, values by 2030. So we have the five microgram, which would be the WHO air quality guideline. So the most strictest scenario, then the interim target at 10 and another interim target uh, at uh, 15 micrograms per cubic meter and all of them to be achieved in 2030. So next step here, after defining these scenarios, they looked with a modeling what needs to be done? What kind of um, what can we achieve with the current legislation in terms of um, compliance at the different um, measurement stations? And here is an example, just modeling the baseline scenario, nothing, not changing anything. And this is modeling with all kinds of additional, um, um, more stringent. Um, uh, um, interventions and they look how you know how many places how many um how how would the exposure develop uh, under certain combinations of um interventions and legislation um now here is a um the number of sampling sites for um air pollution um that would still exceed uh, the limit value, the here defined limit value in 2030 without passing any additional laws. And if we look at this here, without passing any, any additional legislation, um, all measurement sites in Europe would be aligned with a limit value of 15 micrograms per cubic meter PM 2.5. If nothing else is passed, only 6% of measurement stations would be would not comply with the 10 micrograms and 71% would act would um, not comply or would be higher than the five micrograms. Now the next step is um, they calculated benefit cost ratios for each of these scenarios. And um, they found and the benefits, of course, are benefits from, from um, saving costs due to um, fewer deaths and to less um, healthcare costs. And um, the costs are the costs that you need for um, implementing um, additional measures to clean the air. And uh, what they found was that for all of these scenarios, the benefits were much larger than the costs. The highest benefit to cost ratio was here in um, the scenario um, above five, uh, with a, a limit value of 15, um, but still very clear benefit cost ratios for the more stringent um, um, limit values that would need more, more um, uh, costly interventions. 
uh, they also calculated the net benefit of you know, costs versus savings. And uh, you see the numbers here. These are billions of euros per year. Um, and finally, the commission decided that this would be that this was their favorite um, approach. And this is actually then the limit value they choose for their proposal. Um, and here is, in a nutshell, the, um, the most important parts of the proposal. You see here the new proposed limit values, 10 for PM2.5 and 20 for NO2, plus a long-term objective for ozone. Um, here are the old values from 2008, and you see it's, of course, much better. But then here you see the what the WHO is um, uh, recommending, and you can see that the proposed values are still twice as high as what WHO is recommending. Um, in the proposal, the, the aim currently is to achieve these limit values here by 2030. So by then, um, every uh, measurement station needs to be in, in compliance with these values. In addition to these limit values, the um, ambient air quality directive um, includes uh, a so-called average exposure reduction obligation for annual PM2.5 and NO2, which means that in this case, every 10 years, uh, the um, annual value has to decrease by 25% until the WHO air quality guidelines are achieved. Um, another aspect in the air quality directive is um, a regular review of science to make sure that um, uh, the limit values and the other standards are in line with um, scientific, the increase of scientific knowledge. Um, Further elements in this new directive include that uh, there will be a, a slight increase in monitoring. There will be some the establishment of some super sites where ultrafine particles and black carbon and ammonia is going to be um, measured. Um, for the first time, modeling will be used to um, inform the siting of um, monitoring sites so that actually the most polluted areas are being covered um, by the monitoring sites. Uh, one element that's uh, problematic is that um, particulate matter from natural sources can be deducted from the measured values um, which means, and, and these natural sources include wildfires, sand dust storms, and um, um, yeah, so the concentration from, from these sources can be deducted and won't lead to um, uh, non-compliance uh, in these measurement sites. And finally, there are some um, provisions for access to justice so that um, uh, citizens can actually sue their country for um, in case of non-compliance. Um, now, the um, uh, scientific societies have formed um, some statements and, and uh, critique of the proposed AAQD uh, and the impact assessment. And our main points are that um, regarding the impact assessment, that many potential policy options and actions are missing in these scenarios that look at how much can actually be achieved in terms of reduction. Um, you know, when, when um, for, it looks like uh, um, it is not feasible to actually reach WHO air quality guideline values. Um, because the current uh, technical interventions that are included in the feasibility scenario, um, because the feasibility scenario is, is limited to these technical interventions, and they do not include um, other um, interventions such as low emission zones, behavioral changes in terms of um, reduced um, traffic uh, and um, um, other behavioral changes. So um, this is 
one uh, important point of critique that the feasibility scenario does not include all possible interventions. Um, another point of critique is that the adverse health effects of air pollution are underestimated because um, they are not using the most relevant um, information on relative risks uh, that uh, Massimo just showed. They're using global estimates for health effects and not the ones that are most relevant for Europe. Um, and um, one another point of critique is that uh, the fine the the choice of the um, limit value of the scenario that was done by the um, European Commission that they did not choose the scenario with the maximal um, net benefit but one uh, that had a uh, lower than the optimal net financial benefit. Um, regarding the AAQD proposal, um, we believe that the proposal is not in line with the scientific evidence. It's, it's not in line with the WHO air quality guideline levels. And um, not only does it not include the air quality guideline levels um, at, for 2030, it doesn't even give a clear path towards these guideline values beyond 2030. So the only thing they give now is the um, um, limit values of 10 and 20 for PM2.5 and NO2, but they do not say where we go beyond 2030. Um, then uh, one point of critique is that uh, for ozone, uh, there's only a target value uh, foreseen and not a limit value. And the fitness check that was done in 2019 clearly stated that um, target values are not effective. Um, they don't need to be complied with and therefore um, most uh, countries do not really care about um, these target values. So to really effectively regulate ozone, we need limit values. Um, then we believe that uh, we need more effort to decrease inequalities in health burdens from air pollution, which would mean that actually um, more measurements are done in um, uh, marginalized communities and in highly polluted communities, um, that uh, we would need more, more measurement um, uh, monitoring sites there. And finally, we believe that um, the deduction of the natural source contributions oops, from um, uh, the measured uh, concentrations should at least be limited um, because of course these natural source contributions are also um, health relevant. Um, we wrote a commentary on the proposed immune air quality directive, uh, which was uh, published here in Environmental Epidemiology. And there is an Italian uh, translation available at the end of June, which you can find here. Okay, so finally I was asked to, um, you know, give you some hint of what the typical, what's the opposition that we get when we, um, advocate for stricter air quality regulation and what the, the most important counter arguments are. And some of them come from Italy, um, specifically this one here, uh, but it's not limited to Italy. So the, the most important concern for most people is that they say it's not feasible to reach WHO air quality guideline values by 2050, let alone by 2030. And the argument here are um, various um, uh, um, models uh, that show that specifically in the Po Valley, but also in Eastern Europe, uh, these lower value limit values could not be achieved. However, um, as I mentioned before, in this feasibility study, it's technically, it's called the maximal technical feasible reduction scenario. Um, as I mentioned before, this does not include many of the potential interventions that can be done and are in the hand of the, um, of the national legislators. And they include, for example, um, the uh, low, having low emission zones, new fuels. Um, they include 
the strong political will to achieve um, modal shifts in transportation as well other lifestyle changes um, which would all um, add to reducing um, uh, additional emissions. So the feasibility is not really an argument because it is very much related to political will and we have seen what can be achieved under um, times of emergency such as the pandemic, um, what political will can actually do uh, if it's there and, and um, how much changes can also be um, achieved then. In addition, the Netherlands, they have actually achieved a reduction from 17 to 10 micrograms per cubic meter um, of the mean measured concentrations in 10 years. So they have been very successful in really coming down um, by um, seven micrograms in a relatively short time. So it, this shows that it is really possible to get down with these um, concentrations. A second concern is that um, in the um, model runs that the baseline concentrations are already underestimated. That means the, these model runs would be too optimistic. And this was, this was brought forward specifically by um, political representatives from um, the Lombardy region. And for their argument, they used uh, the modeling run done by the European Commission. And then they looked at the concentrations of the measurement stations contrasted these and said um, that they are um, that these measurements are actually much higher than what is modeled here that they measure that the models are way too optimistic however this is um, this is just wrong because in these models here um, they model on a very different scale on a seven by seven kilometer scale but the compliance with measurement stations, they actually do on a very small scale additional model. So um, the comparison here that is brought forward by the Lombardy um, politicians is just actually a wrong comparison. Um, in fact, the Dutch evaluations show that um, there's a very good agreement between the fine scale model and um, the actual measurements from the uh, measurement stations. Barbara, please, if you can, you know. Yeah, I'll be done in two minutes. Yep. Okay. So then another, uh, I think probably one of the largest concerns is that um, we cannot put any more burden on the economy. It's This is just too expensive to um, get the values down. Well, in fact, um, the cost of air pollution are huge. It's estimated that they it costs about 940 billion per year. And uh, we can receive huge economic gains by um, reducing uh, air pollution exposure. The net domestic uh, gross product gains by 2030 are expected to be about half a percent for the strictest um, um, uh, limit values. So not only does our economy is, is being hurt, but they will. Um, benefit from stricter regulations. The econo economic gains are mainly due to reduction of healthcare costs, and it's um, up here where you can see it's healthcare loss um, benefits from lesser uh, lost work days, from ecosystem damage, crop yield losses, forest damage. Um, so overall, there's a huge potential financial gain by reducing air pollution. And finally, um, one concern, air pollution has already proved so much. Um, other issues are more important. Uh, well, we have seen the numbers that Massimo showed. Air pollution in Europe, it's still number eight risk factor um, and uh, still has a huge burden of about 400,000 deaths every year. So this is still um, one of the major concerns we have, which needs to be addressed. Yeah, and with this, I'd like to summarize and conclude. Um, as we've seen, air pollution still causes a huge disease burden in Europe. Uh, the EC proposal is an improvement, but it does not go far enough. Most importantly, there is no clear pathway towards WHO air quality guidelines. Um, however, air pollution is so costly, uh, reductions are also economically beneficial. And in addition, air pollution reduction comes with large co-benefits for climate, economy, and quality of life. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Barbara, for your very interesting talk. At the very beginning, you gave us some very important insights on how the European institutions work, which is not so straightforward for, for all of us, uh, but then you also gave us a very clear overview of the um, of the pattern of the um, of the new uh, EU directive and also the concerns that how how to address the concerns that the various member states are uh, bringing to the EU. Uh, so I think it was a fundamental a fundamental speech to go on with our discussion. And I think it also introduces very well the next uh, speaker who I'd like to introduce myself who is Margarita Tolotto. Margarita is a senior policy officer for air quality and noise at the European Environmental Bureau. And she will uh, talk to us about what is the role of NGOs and what are the main issues in Brussels. Margarita. Thank you, thanks, thanks a lot. I will try to be brief so we can also save some time for discussion. Happy to, to take questions later. Uh, I'm working for the European Environmental Bureau. It's a federation of environmental NGOs. I'm based in Brussels, but we represent members from 38 countries and we have around 180 members. The work we do is to basically catalyze the expertise from national groups and um, elaborate advocacy strategies for the uh, advocacy work at uh, EU level. So we do uh, good lobby towards the institutions um, presenting and representing uh, European citizens. We obviously uh, try to do our best to use the evidence that all of you scientists are producing for allowing us to produce um, elaborate solid arguments when we contribute to EU decision making processes. Um, I think a lot has already been said regarding what is the uh, scenario at EU level at the moment. I would like probably to spend some words on uh, what is specifically happening in the European Parliament. Um, the Environment Committee is going to take its position on uh, the 27th of June, voting on the set of amendments they want to uh, make to the Commission proposal on the Ambient Air Quality Directive. And we have seen that for the majority of the cases, uh, there, is, uh, there are quite good improvements compared to what the Commission has put forward. And at the moment, we are trying to give a last push to secure that um, the Environment Committee in the European Parliament agrees on uh, having in the directive the obligation to comply with uh, WHO uh, air quality guidelines by 2030. Um, politically speaking, it's uh, a very hectic discussion. Uh, there are uh, different um, starting points depending on the country the member of the European Parliament is coming from. Uh, what has emerged clearly since uh, the proposal of the Commission uh, was published last year is that uh, Italy is one of the biggest opponents, uh, the biggest probably, or among the bigger opponent to already what the Commission has put forward. So for, for Italy, and when I mean, um, when I say Italy, I specifically refer to the uh, regions of the north of Italy, um, are really, really fighting hard. All their efforts are made for uh, destroying the Commission proposal, which is not uh, asking to go for WHO by 2030. So they are really looking and doing all they can to diminish the ambition of the legislation. And therefore, I don't think they are doing a good service to the citizens living in the uh, north of Italy regions, to be honest. Uh, I'm not sure this is a topic which is uh, very well discussed or covered by the media in Italy. It's probably something on which additional efforts are needed. Um, there is not yet uh, any official position being communicated by the central Italian government. But I invite you all to follow the discussion that is going to take place on Tuesday next week in the afternoon. There is a council debate open um, for web stream. So you will be able to listen to what member states representatives are saying regarding the commission proposal. Hopefully Italia, uh, Italy also speaking up, but hopefully other countries as well uh, taking the floor to say that they actually want to be more ambitious than what the commission has suggested. Um, any, any voice in the debate which can contribute to clarify that feasibility is purely a political uh, issue and what we are discussing here is not uh, 
any win at the national uh, or next European election, but is the health of uh, children, ourselves, uh, parents, etc. That would really help in making it clear that science uh, is there and uh, this political debate is very much uh, in need of listening to science instead of feasibility and political, short-term political gains. And there is a specific argument that uh, the north of Italy regions put forward every time. There is this orographic condition aspect. Uh, as it was mentioned before, um, this is very much related to accumulation of pollution, meaning that if you cut pollution at source, you can also get rid of this argument about orographic conditions. And that's exactly what Italy is not doing with um, concentration and emission production remaining regular during the year not investing in a um, good solution to change this scenario. And we can actually see it also um, because of the infringement that are uh, being uh, open against Italy. Um, another sign to qualify the political will of the central Italian government actually is the fact that uh, there is not yet updated national pollution control program available online. The National Emission Ceiling Directive is demanding the National Pollution Control Program, the first one to be um, uh, delivered to the Commission by the 1st of April 2019. Not only Italy has taken more than almost one year more to deliver its first one, but then it also didn't update it. And we were expecting the updated version of the program by 1st of April 2023, as demanded by the directive, because it's saying the first in 2019 and then after four, and every four years. And I think this is also a sign uh, clearly that air quality is not an important topic in, uh, uh, in Italy, unfortunately, at least among the official institutions. And the debate in Brussels, uh, in European Parliament as well, is reflecting this very well, unfortunately. Um, we do um, see a risk for Italy to build up majority around this attitude, putting forward also financial arguments, which are not specifically very credible for Italy, given that um, we also announce and present ourselves as one of the, especially the north of Italy region, uh, bigger producer of GDP for, for the European Union. So uh, if we cannot, who can add? Uh, I mean, we, I say we because I'm from the Veneto region, sorry. <laughs> but if the north of um, Italy region cannot, who else can, can do things to reduce uh, air pollution? So uh, the debate is very hectic. Um, I was glad to hear that there was uh, a focus also on agriculture and pollution. Uh, there are, have been studies uh, conducted in the UK showing, for example, that the PM 2.5 concentrations that are registered in the UK for the 60% are coming from uh, agriculture because they are generated by ammonia um, emissions. And if you consider that, for example, uh, in the Brescia province, the uh, for every person, there are two pigs and one cow. You can clearly identify where the issue is. Intensification of agricultural practices and also uh, bad practices when uh, cultivating our fields like manure spreading instead of injection, uh, which correspond clearly to the pigs that you can uh, see in monitoring data. Uh, I mean, there are very small things that are not difficult to do like covering storage, injection manure, and uh, with the long-term view of reducing also animal intensification, which will for sure deliver good result and will save a lot of money and will save a lot of health of all of us. And those things seems not to be uh, important for, uh, for Italy at this stage. I really warmly invite you to follow the discussion on the 20th of June. I think it will be uh, really uh, a good way to get a full immersion in the debate uh, among member states that are supposed to take their first political position on the 16th of October. So this is just the first open discuss discussion on, on the topic. Um, I am uh, I'm happy to leave the floor to the moderator for the question and answer. Thanks. Thank you very much, Margarita, for your intervention. Uh, unfortunately, since we are running a bit late, we don't have much time for Q and A's. Also, because uh, uh, in, in in the meantime, there was there was a lot going on in the Q and A section of the uh, of the chat. So 
I um, we will have we will uh, direct. We, uh, I want to thank all the international speakers that uh, uh, talked so far, and now we can move to the discussion with the Italian institutions. Everybody, obviously, who wants to stay is invited to stay, and but we will switch to Italian now. And uh, do così la parola ad Andrea Ranzi di Arpa Emilia Romagna, coordinatore del uh, gruppo di lavoro epidemiologia ambientale dell'Associazione Italiana di Epidemiologia. Andrea. Grazie, <coughs> grazie Michele. Thank you very much to, to the four speaker in, in the, this uh, very interesting session. Ah, I switch to Italian and uh, um, Apriamo, eh, siamo un po' in ritardo, quindi io non ruberò eh, assolutamente altro tempo. Apriamo a, una, a un breve giro di tavolo per una discussione eh, con eh, i, i, tre, i, i tre invitati a questa, a questa piccola e eh, breve discussione. Io eh, lascio, lascerò la parola sottolineando solo un paio di aspetti che, che ho visto un po'... Eh, ripetersi nelle, nelle, nelle presentazioni, la necessità, soprattutto fin dalla prima presentazione, che poi l'abbiamo vista in tutte le altre, di attuare eh, delle sinergie tra i vari settori per avere migliori risultati e per l'ottica dei co-benefici e quindi sia per cercare di arrivare a migliori risultati nella direzione dell'inquinamento, sia per avere migliori eh, benefici su più settori. Eh, abbiamo la questione della, di... Eh, integrare le, le esperienze anche modellistiche, cercare di capire bene come eh, unire le questioni legate a eh, dati di monitoraggio ambientale, quindi limiti su, sui dati misurati e eh, con, il, il concetto dell'esposizione dell della popolazione. Quindi questo punto di vista metodologico è un invito a noi a fare anche più sforzi nel, nel unire queste due eh, realtà, queste due informazioni e dare strumenti migliori anche per legare queste due, questi due aspetti. E, e poi è stato anche tangenzialmente toccato la parte dei, dei, delle, delle varamente aggiusti, le, le misure che, che eh, vengono, vengono adottate a volte sono, eh, si rischia che siano, che, che aumentino le disuguaglianze invece di ottenere quello che vorrebbero, cioè di, di ridurre. Quindi ci sono, ci sono tanti temi che sono, sono aperti. Io invito eh, adesso eh, i, i tre eh, ospiti che abbiamo in questa piccola tavola rotonda a dare un loro contributo di commento da, 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 dai, vari, dai vari settori, abbiamo unito la, la parte ambientale, la parte sanitaria, quindi eh, darei la parola a, a Pascolino Rossi, che è direttore dell'ufficio quarto del, del Ministero della Salute, per, per un commento sulla, sulla, su quello che abbiamo sentito sulla, sulla giornata. Grazie. Eh, grazie Andrea, quindi da quello che capisco si va avanti in Italia, giusto? Allora... allora... Siamo in italiano, giusto adesso la sessione. Sì, sì, sì. Ok, buongiorno a tutti. Beh, eh, quello che abbiamo sentito è, è assolutamente, eh, in inglese si direbbe impressive, nel senso che abbiamo eh, dei dati sulla eh, eh, su mortalità ospedalizzazione da agenti atmosferici che eh, ci devono assolutamente far pensare, tanto che ci fanno pensare che a questo punto eh, la situazione relativa all'ambiente sia quasi diventata più una situazione sanitaria che, che, eh, che puramente ambientale. Il eh, Ministero della Salute ovviamente sta cercando di eh, assumersi le responsabilità che gli competono per eh, cercare di mettere in pratica, noi abbiamo visto nella presentazione di Barra, ma anche nei precedenti, quanto ci sia ancora da fare, quanto ci sia di allineamento anche tra quello che accade in fase di discussione tua didattiva e quello che accade invece, quello che è già accaduto, almeno in termini di requirements, a livello di WHO. Questo ci deve far riflettere, perché poi eh, abbiamo anche visto nella prima presentazione come eh, gli, eh, gli agenti inquinanti eh, non derivino semplicisticamente un po' come tutti ormai credono dalle classiche fonti, ma ce ne sono molte altre che eh, contribuiscono. Noi eh, stiamo cercando appunto di mettere insieme un sistema 
di eh, integrazione tra eh, valutazioni e dati di tipo sanitario e valutazioni e dati di tipo ambientale che a nostro avviso è l'unico modo per portare avanti un discorso che possa avere, dare i, dei frutti nel medio periodo per eh, mettere in pratica delle misure eh, importanti. E tutto quello che è stato detto, devo dire, eh, fa parte della, delle linee di azione dei progetti che noi abbiamo finanziato a livello di PNRR barra PNG e che eh, hanno messo in moto un meccanismo importante che eh, darà i suoi frutti nel giro di qualche anno, ma che eh, dovrebbe, anzi deve assolutamente, collegare eh, tutti gli attori coinvolti al, al fine di cercare di arrivare a quello che eh, OMS e direttiva in questa maniera un po' più forme ci, ci chiedono. Non solo, eh, stiamo per partire anche con eh, una questione che apparentemente, almeno solo apparentemente a mio avviso, riguarda eh, matrici diverse da quella di cui parliamo oggi, perché anche i progetti che stiamo per fare sui siti inquinati e sulle, sui siti sottoposti a politica a, avranno un loro eh, riscontro anche per quanto riguarda eh, la potenziale eh, negatività, effetto negativo dei, di inquinanti atmosferici che vengono rilasciati in atmosfera sulle popolazioni incidenti in questi siti. E noi sappiamo anche che eh, ci sono delle aree critiche che in Italia eh, hanno ostacolato finora eh, i miglioramenti che ci sono stati, sono in trend, sappiamo benissimo che pur essendo in trend molto spesso sono, eh, eccedono, abbiamo visto nelle presentazioni precedenti, eccedono i limiti che eh, ci verrebbero imposti dalla legge, abbiamo una serie di figure di infrazione a cui dobbiamo rispondere, ma noi abbiamo anche problemi che da un, da un lato ci consentono di opporci in qualche modo al agli impianti, dall'altro però ci, eh, ce li portano quasi dentro casa, questa è la nostra ancora nostra fotografia, eh, alcune particolari condizioni meteo-climatiche per cui ieri a Milano e a Lugano dove avevo due amici c'era cioè, una splendida giornata di sole, a Roma eh, sembrava di essere nella foresta pluviale e abbiamo il problema della densità di popolazione particolarmente alta in alcune aree della, del nostro paese e il, le misure che ovviamente eh, ancora scarseggiano per quanto riguarda la reale protezione della salute e, la, e interventi di prevenzione eh, con riferimento all'inquinamento atmosferico. Ora è chiaro che noi abbiamo identificato e conosciamo quali sono le nostre aree critiche, dobbiamo cercare di intervenire prima là dove e il problema è maggiormente presente, si è parlato tanto di Valpadana, ma noi abbiamo delle zone nel sud d'Italia che purtroppo direi nulla hanno da invidiare. Quindi anche in questo caso abbiamo cercato, stiamo cercando di mettere insieme eh, tutti quanti eh, gli attori del sistema in una rete che eh, veramente abbracci l'intero territorio nazionale. Eh, le azioni sono appena partite, ma non sono oh, nate da nulla, nascono da una serie di progetti che noi abbiamo già sviluppato in passato, che ci hanno dato di là, nascono da un piano di prevenzione che finalmente vede al centro eh, la prevenzione da inquinamento e da cambiamento climatico come uno dei pilastri, uno delle macro aree eh, prioritarie. Abbiamo tutta una serie di interventi che stiamo mettendo in campo, che non, 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 non lo dico tanto per dire che non sono un politico, sono un tecnico, stiamo veramente cercando di mettere insieme eh, un'infrastruttura un a, a rete che ancora non esisteva e che ha bisogno di, essere, di arrivare a un punto per darci i risultati che speriamo e in tal modo speriamo di poterci eh, confrontare in maniera più idonea nel prossimo futuro con le problematiche del clima particolato e alla, eh, allo zono e a tutti gli impianti atmosferici. Io intanto mi fermo e poi così anche gli altri possono intervenire, non so se poi sarà necessario eh, concludere. Grazie Andrea.
Grazie a Torino. Eh, do la parola a, a Marco Martuzzi, direttore del Dipartimento Ambiente e Salute dell'Istituto Superiore di Sanità. Grazie Marco per il tuo intervento. Eh, sì, grano, grazie a te Andrea, grazie agli organizzatori di questa um, eh, molto utile giornata. Eh, è stato utile appunto raccogliere tutte le informazioni disponibili sia sulla scienza sia sul il corso del, della decisione. È molto tardi, il tempo è poco, cercherò di fare due o tre punti mirati, cominciando appunto dalla, dalla parte diciamo, di, di, eh, scientifica di produzione di, di evidenza e abbiamo visto i grandi passi avanti di, eh, de, degli ultimi lavori e ho apprezzato eh, veramente tanto le, gli interventi sia di, di, di Giorgio eh, che di Massimo. Ehm, sul, sul fronte de, degli impatti sulla salute, se, da tanti anni vengono prodotti questi numeri, alcuni sono un po' confusi addirittura da, dalla quantità di numeri, bisogna in effetti stare un, un po' attenti, ma quello è, è, il, è il corso de, della ricerca. Ehm, bisogna secondo me anche prestare attenzione a, a come formulare, quest, come costruire questi, eh, questi numeri, questi eh, argomenti, per renderli il più efficaci possibile proprio nel nel dibattito politico. Eh, immagino che ci siano, oggi c'era poco tempo anche per quello, ma immagino che ci siano dei numeri anche su, su eh, distribuzione all'interno di questi impatti, in particolare per, per quanto riguarda gruppi vulnerabili, eh, bambini, anziani. Eh, C'è la questione dell'equità, che l'inquinamento dell'aria inganna un po', nel senso che sembra un, un fattore di rischio ehm, democratico ma in realtà è diffi difficile che lo sia. Eh, dico questo perché eh, l'argomento gruppi vulnerabili e disuguaglianze ha un, un, certo, un forte peso in, in termini di eh, spingere le azioni. Eh, Barbara ha toccato brevemente anche il tema del, dei costi economici, mm, può essere utile anche quello, c'è stato mm, tempo fa c'era un grandissimo interesse su, su, su questo aspetto, Potrebbe essere utile anche, come dire, corredare a livello nazionale eh, questi, eh, questi numeri con considerazioni economiche, eh, in particolare perché un, uno degli argomenti di, del contendere è appunto questo impatto, il fatto che eh, perseguire obiettivi così ambiziosi costerebbe, eh, avrebbe dei, dei risvolti negativi dal punto di vista economico e produttivo, particolarmente parlando del... Della, delle regioni del nord. Eh, tutto questo appunto in un certo senso è, è quasi secondario perché adesso il, il, il vero eh, tema sul, sul più, più acceso è quello del cosa fare. Eh, il cosa fare è cosa fare per appunto perseguire questi, decidere quali obiettivi perseguire e cosa fare per perseguirli. Il um, è vero che, lo diceva Barbara, l'esempio, il confronto è piuttosto eh, è, è brutto dal punto di vista, diciamo, di confronto. Barbara citava l'Olanda, no? Chi è, in, chi è in questo business da parecchi anni come me ricorda, ricorderete alcuni di voi, eh, 15, 10 anni fa, le mappe d'Europa, c'erano sempre le due macchie rosse in pianura padana e in Olanda, più o meno, Paesi Bassi. Adesso effettivamente di, di, la macchia del, della pianura padana persiste e eh, eh, in Olanda meno. Quindi, come dire, la, effettivamente l'argomento di, di fattibilità eh, va, esplorato, va esplorato meglio. Eh, ora, il, il cosa fare? Eh, io, sappiamo bene che gli sforzi sono, tanti sforzi sono, sono in corso, penso ce lo dirà meglio eh, Peppe Bortone in un minuto, tra un minuto, ma ehm, eh, penso che sia l'area, lo dicevi anche tu Andrea in apertura, il, il tema più, eh, più importante che, che secondo me va, va affrontato, eh, diamoci su, sul, sul tema del cosa fare lo stesso, eh, come dire, quando si, si parla di produrre evidenze sugli, sugli effetti sulla salute ci diamo un, uno standard molto alto no? di prove, di evidenza prima di poter dire le cose diamoci lo stesso, lo stesso livello le stesse soglie di, di effettivamente 
eh, dimostrazione del fatto che le cose sono fattibili o meno per poi affrontare la, il cosa fare. E, sono molto contento che siano stati citati da diverse persone, ha cominciato Giorgio, ma poi anche gli interventi successivi, eh, temi secondo me non, non ancora esplorati, com considerati come dovrebbero. Si è parlato di tutti questi anni, decenni, eh, di, di trasporto, di produzione di energia, si è parlato molto meno di agricoltura, <coughs> agricoltura e allevamento, eh, e penso che siano aree dove si possa fare molto di più. Mi, mi sembra di capire che, ad esempio, l'attività la, la, in, in tema di agricoltura e allevamento non siano sottoposte allo stesso iter legislativo del, eh, autorizzativo de, de, eh, dell della produzione di energia, ad esempio, e penso che sia un aspetto molto, molto importante da, da considerare, eventualmente aggiustare se, se in effetti è così. Um, e quindi eh, appunto è sul, è sul tema di eh, integrazione e considerazione di tutti i settori eh, rilevanti eh, una, una seria evidence based eh, eh, discussione sulla evidence anche da, dalla parte del, eh, del, del, degli interventi che secondo me eh, può, può migliorare la il, il dialogo e l'identificazione di, di uh, attività, di, di scelte più uh, che siano migliori per la salute, che in effetti questi impatti uh, sanitari, questi numeri uh, sono davvero uh, uh, giganteschi, siamo un po' assuefatti ma, uh, a, a questi numeri, ma uh, uh, sono, sono reali, a questo punto l'evidenza la, la, scientifica è solidissima, ormai l'inquinamento dell'aria è, un, è il più classico dei temi ambientali dove, dove sappiamo quantificare bene gli impatti eh, in, in molti dare un dettaglio che non, nessun altro nessun altra eh, inquinante possiamo, possiamo fare pensare agli agenti chimici siamo ben lontani da questo, da questo livello di, di conoscenze e di affidabilità de, 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 dei modelli e delle stime quindi ehm, Direi che, eh, diceva giustamente Lino Rossi, del, dello sforzo in corso su molti progetti ai quali anche noi partecipiamo attivamente e in particolare eh, penso che questa nuova tornata di cui lui, a cui lui faceva riferimento sui, diciamo, sui siti inquinati eh, sia promettente, i siti inquinati nel senso diciamo, moderno, tra virgolette, eh, in cui uno, un ricercatore eh, e un decisore considerino il, 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 il contesto esteso, no? non solo l'emissione di qualche agente inquinante, ma anche eh, il quadro dove si opera, in particolare il quadro di cambiamenti climatici che eh, va, eh, va tenuto ovviamente in, in prima fila. Eh, voglio concludere sottolineando eh, una parola già detta più volte ma forse mai abbastanza la questione dei co-benefici eh, parlando di eh, interventi in diversi settori eh, il, eh, esplicitare, identificare, esplicitare i, i co-benefici è un, un argomento molto forte, molto importante eh, di nuovo parlando di agricoltura eh, le emissioni della produzione di, di carne ad esempio sono molto elevati e ridurre il consumo di carne ha anche con benefici in termini di nutrizione eh, che sono quantificabili in, in uh, uh, numeri molto importanti lo stesso vale ad esempio per la, uh, il trasporto uh, urbano in questo caso uh, ridurre le emissioni per forza produce guadagni in termini di, di attività fisica o rumore o, o, o incidenti stradali. Quindi eh, l'argomento dei co-benefici che eh, non è nuovo, ma non è secondo me abbastanza utilizzato, eh, merita un, un ulteriore diciamo, investimento di ricerca e discussione. E con questo mi fermo ringraziandovi di nuovo. Grazie Marco, eh, ci cioè, hai dato molti spunti, ci sono una, un, uno che ho 
che ho colto, che, che è anche molto attuale rispetto a quello che diceva anche eh, Rino prima, la, la modalità anche di, di uscita di questi numeri, di questa quantità di, di, di elaborazioni che vengono fatte, sarà, sarà anche utile un ragionamento anche alla luce dei, dei nuovi progetti PNC che, si stanno, eh, che, stanno, che hanno cominciato le loro attività e che hanno nella parte di, 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 di comunicazione, di forma di arte anche, cosa, una, una rilevanza molto, molto importante che andrà concertata per evitare di eh, creare dei... dei delle situazioni in cui chi non è bene dentro questi numeri e ne capisce anche le differenze potrebbe reagire come meno attendibili delle, 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 dei messaggi quantitativamente differenti. Quindi questo è sicuramente un aspetto molto importante. Eh, lascio la parola adesso a, al mio direttore, a Giuseppe Bortone, direttore generale di Arpai, eh, referente ambiente e salute per il Sistema Nazionale di Protezione Ambientale e presidente di Asso Arpa. Eh, ti lascio la parola a te. Sì, grazie, grazie a Raie per, per l'invito. Eh, eh, le suggestioni e gli spunti sono tanti, per cui adesso è difficile sintetizzare la voglia di, di mettere dei punti e delle eh, visioni del settore ambientale è tanto. Spero di essere brillante per la sintesi. Allora vado per parole chiave. E nel settore la parte ambientale, il sistema Uh, nazionale di protezione ambientale, le agenzie regionali ambientali in particolare uh, sposano integralmente la linea e l'esigenza di la, una riduzione importante dei livelli emissivi per il miglioramento della qualità dell'aria. E in questo sostanzialmente, senza entrare nelle sfumature dei limiti previsti dalla direttiva, però indubbiamente facciamo salva tutti quanti noi la, la finalità di quella direttiva che va in, in quella direzione. Quindi sicuramente dare il pieno appoggio alla, alla nuova direttiva e tutta la disponibilità che vengano accelerate le procedure per l'effettiva adozione e approvazione. Direi che anche per il settore ambientale, ormai anche grazie alle attività che stiamo sviluppando insieme con l'ISS, con grazie al PNC del, uh, sulla salute ambiente, clima, biodiversità, ma in generale ormai eradicato da diversi anni, uh, la consapevolezza che l'emissione, gli inquinanti atmosferici, l'impatto e l'effetto sulla salute che questi inquinanti, inquinanti hanno. Di fatto. I piani sono i piani di qualità dell'aria, mi riferirò in particolare per esempio a quello della, della regione che noi stiamo andando ad approvare in assemblea, la seconda tornata di piano della qualità dell'aria integrato regionale, la approveremo in assemblea legislativa al prossimo ottobre. Sono dei piani integrati che prevedono un enorme sforzo di progettazione, di integrazione di misure che sono intersettoriali, compresi di stili di vita che qualcuno citava ci sono all'interno delle misure. Entrano in un sistema di, di valutazione, di efficacia e di integrazione degli effetti dei, dei diversi, dei diversi sesto, settori e vanno a valutare quali sono gli effetti in relazione agli obiettivi che sostanzialmente si può ricondurre alla riduzione massima della popolazione esposta a concentrazioni, a concentrazioni di rischio uh, di rischio uh, sanitario e um, questa nuova generazione di piani ha anche una valutazione del costo economico in termini comunicativi e di efficacia di azione secondo me dobbiamo fare anche un salto paragrammatico dobbiamo incominciare a comunicare qual è il beneficio ne parlava prima Marco e quindi ad esempio nel piano regionale noi parliamo di quanti mesi si allunga l'aspettativa di vita a realizzazione di quel corpo di misure integrate che devono raggiungere determinati obiettivi, così come è entrato nel gergo della politica dell'assemblea regionale i, la, i costi sanitari risparmiati in termini di efficacia sulla, e di riduzione di effetti sulla salute, quindi minore risorse necessarie al piano della prevenzione sanitaria. E, e su questo noi abbiamo le previsioni, ragioniamo in termini 
di previsioni di, di, di riduzione di popolazione esposta. Ci sono le valutazioni, ve le richiamo in termini di efficacia di questi scenari di intervento per ciascun singolo inquinante. Allora, il piano, per esempio, per quello che riguarda l'Emilia Romagna, prevede al 2030 un abbattimento di PM2.5 in termini percentuali rispetto al 2017 del 46% applicando quelle che sono le attuali tecnologie, gli attuali indirizzi, le attuali strategie di livello comunitario. Quello che è lo scenario, diciamo, lo chiamiamo CLE, quello di riferimento, applicando il portafoglio di misure, di norme, di limiti che sono attualmente disponibili a livello di Commissione europea. Per raggiungere gli obiettivi prefissati c'è bisogno di introdurre ulteriori misure e queste vanno a carico dei territori. Questi sono anche, possono essere letti come elementi di diseguaglianza. Nel senso che per il PM25 da 46 che ci garantisce l'attuale assetto delle norme dobbiamo arrivare al 61%, quindi un 15% in più che è chiesto ai territori come intervento specifico per vista la realtà territoriale. Per l'ossido d'azoto siamo 55% con uno scenario di riferimento a tendere con le norme, 59% qui c'è un piccolo incremento da garantire attraverso le misure locali ci attendiamo anche degli effetti importanti a seguito poi dell'altro dell percorso che è quello della decarbonizzazione e delle fonti di energia rinnovabili qui prevediamo che ci sarà un grande cambiamento verso la produzione elettrica da fonte rinnovabile quindi questo dovrebbe abbassare il livello delle, delle combustioni e quindi degli NOx un grandissimo sforzo locale, e qua vengo all'esigenza che la Commissione europea, l'Europa, si dia anche all'interno di questo percorso che sto facendo, non solo degli obiettivi di limiti più stringenti, ma anche delle, delle indicazioni eque per tutti i settori, perché tutti i settori si prendano in carico questo obiettivo di riduzione delle emissioni. E vengo all'esempio dell'ammoniaca, con l'attuale assetto delle norme europee il piano riesce a garantire un 8% di riduzione, avete parlato benissimo, i dati ci sono, di quanto è importante l'ammonia che in termini di produzione è di particolato secondario. Bene, se vogliamo raggiungere quei famosi obiettivi del piano per ridurre la popolazione esposta, abbiamo bisogno di un 43% da parte del, 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 degli interventi e delle misure locali. Allora ecco, in questo noi chiediamo che ci sia insieme a questo condiviso sforzo di revisione della direttiva auspicabilmente adeguata ai limiti della, de, definiti dall'OMS dall però ci deve essere perché è una, una, è una questione di equità di equità poi andiamo ai livelli della, della concorrenza dei territori europei dove credo che oltretutto la, la, il richiamo delle condizioni orografiche e meteorologiche non è un alibi italiano e ormai ci sono dei dati assolutamente robusti che lo dimostrano. Sono prodotti dei dati in cui a parità di emissioni non è detto che se si riduce il carico emissivo le concentrazioni siano ridotte equamente in tutte le situazioni meteoclimatiche. Questo non è vero di dimostrato dai dati. Per cui una riduzione di carico emissivo in un luogo per non far nomi Torino, corrisponde a una concentrazione in aria che non è quella che si avrebbe in un'altra parte d'Europa, non mettiamo in concorrenza i territori, eh, eh, a, a parità di carico emissivo ridotto. Quindi questo è un altro elemento che va in qualche, in qualche, maniera, in qualche maniera valutato. Dopodiché, gli altri punti che mi ero... Oh, appuntato sono noi stiamo lavorando in termini di come vi dicevo di popolazione esposta se si ragiona in termini di popolazione esposta e devo dire la direttiva quadro la direttiva nuova di modifica della, sulla qualità dell'aria lo prende in considerazione questo obiettivo di riduzione progressiva della popolazione esposta che potrebbe essere quello magari assunto anche in termini più vincolanti a garanzia di un percorso avviato definendo delle 
percentuali dei target anche annuali che portino alla riduzione. Le stime del piano dicono che sostanzialmente noi non riusciremo, qui c'è tutto il discorso da fare, la modellistica previsionale, quanto affidabile, quanto robusta è, ma è, quelli sono gli strumenti, ci dicono che avremo comunque un livello di popolazione esposta probabilmente, sì, qualche punto percentuale, che si attesterà sopra quei livelli indicati da OMS o, 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 dalla, o dalla direttiva. Allora, su questo è un tema, ripeto, non è un voler procrastinare un percorso che è in dubbio, condividiamo, ha un effetto sulla salute, quindi è, però si tratta di valutare la sostenibilità eh, tecnica del percorso che si va a fare. Altro spunto che la direttiva, la proposta di direttiva fa, e qua siamo anche un po' autoreferenziali, un po' come dire eh, ambiziosi. Credo che sia stato preso molto spunto dall'esperienza delle agenzie regionali, in particolare quelle del bacino padano, sulla capacità di monitorare la qualità del particolare. Questo è un altro aspetto che probabilmente a livello europeo bisogna prendere in considerazione. Allora, quelle centraline che noi chiamiamo di super sito sono state mutuate nella proposta della direttiva. Queste centraline riescono a fare la caratterizzazione del contenuto del particolare. Voi mi insegnate perché studiate gli effetti, che evidentemente un conto è l'impatto del black carbon, un conto può essere l'impatto dei sali di, 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 di ammonio o dei sali di, di solfato. E questo è particolarmente importante in una realtà come l'Italia, dove il particolato è principalmente di carattere secondario. E allora forse, e questo lo dico come invito alla comunità delle epidemiologi, dobbiamo in qualche maniera integrare la nostra capacità di lettura di questi dati insieme a delle capacità di valutazione tossicologica, perché credo che possa essere una delle, delle chiavi interpretative di un fenomeno su cui, ripeto, qui non c'è un'onda di dubbio, le regioni, le agenzie, tanto più le agenzie, sono assolutamente convinte che questo percorso vada assolutamente affrontato, però va affrontato con, eh, abbiamo parlato di science uh, based, eh, sulla base dei dati, delle evidenze, e trattando anche quelle che possono essere condizioni evidentemente di, di, di disparità e di diseguaglianza rispetto agli assetti territoriali dei, dei, dei territori. Grazie, grazie per effettivamente anche le, le indicazioni della direttiva vanno, vanno eh, su, su argomenti che nella nostra realtà, nelle nostre esperienze stiamo, abbiamo cominciato a trattare e dobbiamo, dobbiamo mettere più a sistema come, come suggerisci tu e quindi anche, anche l'input che, che arriva da, da questa discussione può essere eh, utilizzato anche nei, nei progetti che, su cui tanti di noi quasi tutti insomma, siamo impegnati ad attuare quindi la L'invito è, è assolutamente condivisibile e, e condivido il fatto che la, le, le indicazioni della direttiva su, su speciazione, su super siti, sull'esposizione della popolazione siano molto, molto importanti e vadano nella, nella linea che stiamo, stiamo seguendo da, da qualche tempo. Io ringrazio i, i, gli intervenuti e lascio la parola a Michele, mi sembra, per le conclusioni. Sì, grazie Andrea. Allora dichiaro da subito che non ho la pretesa di fare una sintesi di quanto è emerso perché sarebbe presuntuoso oltre che impossibile, però mi permetto di eh, diciamo, lanciare tre flash soprattutto eh, emersi dalla discussione di questa tavola rotonda. Innanzitutto, mh, beh, in primis, eh, Pascolino Rossi ci ha ribadito eh, l'impegno diciamo, politico che eh, si sta mettendo in campo per creare reti su questi argomenti, in particolare per far dialogare il sistema dell'ambiente con il sistema della prevenzione e della sanità e in questo ha incontrato anche alcuni eh, aspetti sull'importanza sull dell'integrazione che sono stati citati dall'ultimo intervento. Sempre Pasqualino ci ha poi parlato dell'importanza della comunicazione, eh, di come certi eh, tipi di risultati, di come forse dobbiamo ancora in, 
imparare a comunicarli ancora meglio in maniera ancora più comprensibile eh, alla popolazione. Eh, argomento che tra l'altro è, è stato ripreso da, anche da Marco Martuzzi eh, insieme a molti altri spunti eh, importantissimi, meritevoli di eh, approfondimento, anche approfondimento di studio da parte di chi come noi si occupa di diciamo, fare ricerca in questo ambito come il tema in primis dei metodi della vulnerabilità del, della relazione tra costi e fattibilità che ha ripreso in parte una, diciamo, un flash però interessantissimo che aveva posto Barbara Hoffman oltre ovviamente al, al tema interessantissimo del, del link con i cambiamenti cioè più che interessantissimo ormai imprescindibile del link con i cambiamenti climatici e poi tutto l'aspetto dei co-benefici. Eh, da ultimo eh, il tema delle sorgenti che poi è stato ripreso in maniera molto importante anche da Giuseppe Bortone eh, che eh, giustamente ha sottolineato l'importanza di eh, preoccuparsi, eh, di avere in mente anche le eh, specificità locali e le criticità del contesto per valutare gli aspetti di fattibilità e di sostenibilità tecnica in un contesto però di piani eh, volti a ridurre le emissioni ed inevitabile comunque appoggio a quello che sono le direttive per la riduzione dell'esposizione nel contesto di piani integrati. Io credo che eh, la giornata di oggi eh, ci abbia aiutato su molti fronti, in primis sull'aspetto informativo, ma poi abbia dato l'infa nuova per procedere nel nostro lavoro di, ehm, di ricerca e programmazione in un argomento così importante come la relazione tra eh, l'inquinamento e la salute. Io ringrazio tutti coloro che sono intervenuti e che hanno partecipato, coloro che sono intervenuti come relatori che hanno, e coloro che hanno partecipato anche attivamente, ha ah, dimenticato importante in, in tutto questo, in tutto di questo eh, diciamo, ambito e eh, discorso, non dimentichiamoci anche dell'importanza che hanno i singoli gli impianti produttivi e quindi l'importanza di sviluppare metodologie nuove eh, di valutazione di metodologie più sempre più precise scusate non tanto nuove ma di valutazione di impatto sanitario questo era un ultimo flash che era emerso da una discussione in chat stavo finendo ringraziando tutti eh, ringraziando l'AI per questa opportunità e dandovi appuntamento al prossimo